<laughs> Make assumptions, right? Um, okay, so I suppose we can proceed from where we left off. It turns out we we um, during our last our last class, um, I think we went all the way up to. Um, discussion of um, qualified Dublin core, I believe, um, and and I'm I'm hoping that maybe with with some of the things that that were being uh, discussed by by people like Angela and um, and uh, Robert, maybe they they make some sense. I don't know if if they do. Which is quite. And it turns out that all of them are. Well, maybe not Angela, so much Angela, but then Robert is going to be extensively looking at um, you know, these different metadata elements, the 15 metadata elements essentially, although um, he's, he's going to restrict his focus to just the descriptive metadata, so things like uh, titles and um, the authors. Uh, I don't know if people remember what Robert is working towards, like the automatic classification of um, the repository content. Um, so, and, and hopefully we were able to put two and two together during his talk, even though his, unlike Angela's focus, his talk was, was more technical, but just a, a recap or a reminder, just to try and emphasize and underscore the importance of metadata. What he's, he's doing, right, is um, he's trying to see if if you can identify, so typically you, you go to the library and you submit a publication, right? And so what he's trying to do is once someone goes and submits a publication, can we, can we mimic what the people in the library do where you, you get that publication and then you read it, you, you associate um, the right metadata with that particular document? Uh, so instead of having a person manually do that process, what he is working towards is to try and automate that whole process. So, you know, come up with some sort of platform um, or a model, an algorithm that will read through the document and then we be able to determine where, which collection or which community the document is supposed to go into. So is it, is it supposed to be ingested into the education? I don't know if I'm making sense here. Is it supposed to be ingested into the School of Education? Uh, we're not here, sadly. Should we, should we ingest the content into the School of Education repository, I mean, uh, community or... Um, just to refresh our minds on what we did. So... Is that a free software? Sorry? Is it a free software? This or...? Not the same one that... Uh, Robert is... Robert's no, so that's, in fact, that's a bulk of the work. He is supposed to to design and implement the software that's supposed to do that. It turns out it's not a very complex thing, actually. And, and in fact, and, and in fact, I don't know how far we've gone as a department to try and uh, make changes to the curriculum for the LIST program. It turns out that our friends out there are doing precisely these things in LIST, not, yeah, this is what they're doing, right? So, so I thought maybe it was you somewhere that wants to use it. No, no, he's, he's going to, to implement the application that it is not a very complex thing to do actually. So what he's doing is, whatever it is he's going to come up with. Currently what people do is uh, they'll log in in the library and then you prepare metadata with the document and then you go through a submission workflow. You specify the metadata, you know, this is the title, these are the authors, this is the publication year. Um, but that's that's a time consuming task. Uh, so what he's, he's wanting to do is to automate that whole process so that the people that are tasked with, with that particular um, exercise only verify that the things that have been automatically detected or the automatic classification is actually co correct. So instead of going through the entire submission workflow, someone in the library will just uh, be presented with a screen that says, this is how we've classified this thing. Can you verify that all the things make sense? Then if you say they make sense, then it's automatically submitted. If there are changes to be made, then you have the opportunity to make the change. What you're doing there is you're cutting down on the amount of time that you're spending 
uh, tagging and then ingesting the coding. And you see that it's a time consuming task because the screenshots just now that will show us exactly how we go about doing this. Um, so specifically what we focused on last time when we met was we looked at um, this uh, simple Dublin core and also qualified Dublin core. And we got a sense of how it's used. Like, like uh, and I think the probably the most interesting and important thing that came out was that when when you're using qualified Dublin core as an organization, you come up with conventions on how you're going to use it. And we saw this when we did a comparison between how um, qualified Dublin core is implemented in the UNSA repository uh, in comparison to the UCT repository. So specifically things like uh, for the UCT repository. Um, for an ETD, both both these people are contributors, but I think for UNSA, uh, for UNSA they are called authors, right? As a right contributor dot author, right? But in here you have contributor dot advisor and contributor dot authors. There's a difference here. Uh, the the difference is perhaps more pronounced when you when you when you when you look at uh, and I guess this is almost the same when you look at something like this and this is interesting actually we we sat down and we were debating on whether out of the fifteen um, elements whether it is correct or it makes sense for us to use the contributor tag instead of the creator tag, right? I don't know if people remember this. Because our definition of, of the creator element is the entity that created the resource, right? Um, a contributor is the entity that contributed to creating the resource. So as an organization, what we're trying to say is as an organization could have decided to say these would just be specified as being creators Right, so dc.creator.author, dc.creator.author, something. Um, so, like they did here, you decide to use the contributor uh, element. But what's important is that hopefully you have this written down somewhere to say, out of the 15 elements that we're using, because we're using Dublin core scheme here, uh, out of these 15 elements, we're going to be using uh, the contributor element in this way. Right. Something else that we we noticed that's tied to the two key things associated with Dublin Core, the fact that it's optional and it's repeatable is the fact that if you if you look at ETDs generated or ETDs um, at UNSA, and I don't have the screenshot here, so I'll go back to do a comparison between what you're seeing here, which is from the University of Cape Town and from UNSA. What we realize is that as an institution, what we have decided to do is to not specify the supervisors or the advisors. And we can get away with that because Dublin Core is, all the elements, all the 15 elements are optional. So we've chosen as, as an institution to say, you know what, we will not be specifying the people that supervise this dissertation. What is important for us is, is just specifying the person who authored the dissertation, the student. It's a, a bit unfair, really, I guess, unfortunate. Um, so I don't know if you can see, this is from UNSA. There's no supervisor element here. So there's no information. We don't know who supervises this person. The only way you find out who supervises this person is if you download or if you read the PDF. If you scroll down here and look at all the elements, they're not there, yeah? Nothing to do with supervisor here, boom. Um, and unfortunately, actually, if you look at the DRGS regulations, you want, in other places, um, and maybe we should go to Open UCT so that you see what I mean. In other places, you list the supervisor names on the cover page. Um, at UNSA, we don't. The only thing you list, actually, the only thing that DRGS requires you to list is um, the examiners, right? So there should be a page for examiners where they're supposed to sign or something. Um, this is, there's no convention, really. This is, so this is not consistent where you have like a signature for the supervisor. But for the most part, you should have uh, this part. This is... If you read through the regulations, this is what DRGS expects, right? But in other places, um, like if we go to to um, UCT, for instance, and you start going through the the um, the dissertations, you notice that uh, 
unless if things have changed, I wanted to search for mine, but I guess we can just look at a random one, one of the most recent ones, which is this. So if we look at the full metadata, it's qualified Dublin Core, then if we, if we open the document to see, and there's nothing wrong in deciding to say, we don't want to see the supervisors, right? it's a decision that the organization makes, right? So UNS has decided to say, supervisor details do not appear anywhere. And in fact, for most of these ETDs, if you browse through the UNSA repository, you notice that the only time that you, you get to, to know who the supervisor was is if you go through, if you read through the acknowledgement part where typically almost everyone will acknowledge, you know, I'd like to thank blah, 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 blah for helping and yada, yada, yada. But observe the UCT thing, right? This is what I mean. So the cover page for, typically most universities actually will insist that the cover page has the details of everybody who supervised or co-supervised this way, right? Um, could be important, might not be important. Uh, but, but I think that, um, uh, and, and I'm bringing this up uh, for the benefit of those of us that, from Zika that perhaps might be wanting to implement this, and I do hope we can implement this. If, even if there the might not be a mandate to have the supervisor details on the, the actual bitstream, the PDF document on the cover page, but what you can do is insist to say, this should be specified as part of the metadata, right? So that when people are searching through it, so it, it helps, it helps when, when browsing for information. I'm sure there are use cases of like when, maybe might be a bad example, but you might be interested in seeing what sort of work Mrs. Zulu has supervised right in the past. So if you, if you, if you, if you, if you are specifying the, um, if you are specifying the, the name, the names, right? Hopefully they've implemented this here. If you are specifying, if you are specifying the supervisor details, someone can easily come through to the repository and just browse through, search for the name of the supervisor. So hopefully the same is here. Let me just search Suleiman maybe. Um, I'll go to, so if I'm browsing through, I'll say I want to browse by author, okay. I'll click the discover button here and then I will say, and this is very unfortunate because it doesn't. Can we go to the least subject repository so that you see what I mean? Um, so um, with, some, with something like this, if I'm looking for work that Mrs. Zulu has done or supervised, I'll just say I'm looking for let's, undergraduate reports, final year project reports, and I want to see what Mrs. Zulu has supervised. I just go here and I browse through. So I know Crispin, for instance, has supervised five projects so far, the content that we have in this subject report. So I don't know if you can see that here, right? You can see the numbers. I don't know if this is visible enough. Is it? No. So the numbers, the name, the numbers alongside the name show you the number of objects of the projects that people have supervised, right? Edward to light on three, um, Mr. Njovu three, you know, Shtundu three, Hauma three, and we only started doing this last year, right? So, but with time, these numbers are probably going to increase. And, and this might be useful for, I guess, fourth years, because unlike, at, at, I guess, at, at master's level, fourth years are told to decide who they want to work with. So they're just sent uh, research interests of stuff, and this is a nice way of not just getting a sense of what someone is interested in, but past projects that that person has supervised. There could be people out there wanting to collaborate with someone at UNSA, right? You might be interested in seeing what that person you want to collaborate with has, has done by way of supervising students. If you're not specifying the supervisors of the ETDs, people won't be able to find that information easily. I mean, you could argue, so you can search, yes, maybe, but you only be able to get hits if you've implemented um, um, open text search, right? So the actual content of the PDF is being indexed, not just the metadata. And we'll look at indexing because it's a dedicated topic on how stuff is indexed, really. But there's a problem again with indexing because we realized uh, um, that the, the problem that, that we noticed was that for UNSA, for instance, 
we, we found, I don't know if you remember, there was a document that, can't, oh, I can't remember the actual document, but it was large in size and we, we had assumed it was scanned, right? I don't know if people remember, no? I wish we could find that document because it turns out I, I, uh, let me see if we can find the document. Is it, this is the one, I think? No. It's unfortunate we can't find it. Anyway, uh, but it turns out it was actually the wrong document, right? So it's not, if you, if you, it's a scanned document, that's problem number one. Problem number two is the information, the metadata, the descriptive information does not match the content of the document. You know, so even if you had implemented, um, you know, indexing of the entire document, it wouldn't help now, would it? Because it's the wrong document altogether. Um, so hopefully this, uh, we are seeing the link between what we're discussing and things that actually use this, uh, this, this kind of concepts um, in, in realistic settings, right? Uh, another thing to notice here is um, problems, right? It's important to sort, sort out problems. If this is, if, if, this is, if these are ETDs, why is it that we have uh, a person like uh, Mary Banda with three, with three entries, right? Perhaps Mary Banda has done uh, a PhD and a master's here, that makes sense, but why three? Maybe they've done two master's here, right? Don't know, but it turns out, right? But if you start going through here, oh, come on. It turns out that um, that might not necessarily be the case. Uh, they don't want us to show what the problem is here. But it, <laughs> it turns out that it's a, a question of uh, erroneously ingesting duplicate, duplicate objects here. Right, so if you start browsing through, um, it doesn't make sense. For the most part, it wouldn't make sense to find uh, Joseph's entries in here two times or something. Like once he submits his masters, right? Because where is the other item coming from, right? Unless you could argue that, okay, fine, there are probably many Mary Bandas. I don't know if people would have guessed that. These are common names. Who knows? Okay, yeah, there we go. So, uh, just going to quickly. Yeah, but, but so I'm, I'm deliberately saying this because I, I think, I mean, these are things to think about as we are implementing, hopefully, some of these things and, and also thinking about potential problems we can solve, I guess. This is not coming up, it's fine. Okay. So we, we, we had a lengthy chat about qualified Dublin core and, you know, simple Dublin core, so we, we have an appreciation of of why this is important, but key thing here is both uh, repeatable and optional. Right, and, and we also discovered that actually when it comes to what we termed as machine to machine interaction, if you remember the three layers we discussed with regards to digital libraries where you have your user, user interface, the service layer and the repository layer, we said that uh, typically you split up the user interface layers. Um, machine, you, so there's, there's a user to machine interaction that takes place and then there's also machine to machine interaction. Interesting enough, the machine to machine interaction in part might involve you pulling information from the repository using a specified protocol, like in this case. Interesting thing about this is that um, this is an example of like markup that is being used here, right? Not HTML, but this is XML, but right? it's tied to what we discussed before. Right? This is markup, and we know it's markup because there's a predefined structure here that you're using to pull out information. Um, thought I'd mention that. Okay, so now that we know how how the fifteen the fifteen um, Dublin core elements are used to specify descriptive information, the question is how exactly do we do we go about um, associating this metadata within a platform like DSpace or ePrints? It doesn't matter what it is. Or the, I mean, the workflows might be different, but the process you go through is more or less the same, right? Um, I thought it would be nice or helpful if we just did a simple walkthrough of like the submission um, workflow, right? Um, and I decided to use screenshots because we, 
last year we had a problem with uh, internet connection and so uh, we figured this time around it would be just better if we just go through screenshots. And, and the screenshots are coming from um, a demo instance of this space. So if you go to this link, uh, you can already, with, even if you don't know how to install this space, you can already um, try and interact with this space so that you have a sense of how this works. And I do encourage us to, to actually go there and um, just create a username and then just see if you can at least attempt to submit um, a few objects so that you have a few of how you, you, you actually go about doing what we are going to describe here. Um, granted, the, the things are normally uh, deleted, I think, after 24 hours or something, because it's a demo instance. There are a lot of people around the world that use this. Um, but maybe for our exercise on Wednesday, what we can do is just set up our own instance and then work with that. Or maybe we can just use the least um, subject repository. Right, so, of course, I mean, this is your user interface. Already we know that, uh, we can already see here that this is all being rendered using HTML because this is a web-based application, right? Um, so once you go here, you um, register as a user. The first thing you do is you log in, right? And typically you want to, you log in if you want to perform admin-centric tasks. So if you want to ingest something into the repository, if you want to modify uh, metadata associated with um, objects that you've ingested into the repository, you need to log in. But if you're just interested in searching and browsing, there's no need to log in, right? Um, so once you log in, this is um, the page that you typically be presented with, and uh, so you can do things like change or modify your user profile. I mean, the usual things that are associated with a typical web-based application. Um, and then, probably can't see it here, but there's, there's an option that allows you to specify that what you're interested in doing is actually submitting content, right? Once you click the button, you're presented with this, uh, um, with this page um, where you, you can initiate a new submission, right? So, which means that you're starting from scratch, like you, you want to submit a new thing, or you can continue off from where you left off, right? Because, because the submission workflow is, is a time-consuming task, each page, so you go through a series of pages you see just now, but each page, at the end of each page, once you're done processing information on one page, you're given the option to save the workflow for later, right? So if you're busy with something, or if something comes up as you're you know, submitting content, you can actually save and go and attend to whatever it is you need to attend to. And then when you come back, you can actually even log out. When you come back and log back in, you can continue from where you left off, right? To finish off the submission workflow. So this is why you're seeing these two uh, unfinished submissions here, right? Um, and then obviously the, the, the first thing that you start with is you specify which, which community or collection you want to submit content into, right? Um, so your your dispers is, and, and this is this is just specific to dispers, I guess. But some some repositories might implement this different. But I thought maybe just get an appreciation of what's happening here. Um, So, so the way the way this space works is, um, I guess, I should, and I wish this thing would work, but it doesn't want to work. The ones are repository seems like it's down. So the the way this space works, right, and the way most of these repository platforms actually work, ePrints and Omeka work, is information is stored in some sort of hierarchical structure, right? Um, and again, the people that decide on what sort of structure is going to be used are uh, the institution, right? So if Zikas was to actually implement this, one of the things I would have to decide, and usually it's people like you actually that do this, um, the people in the library, because there are people that understand what's going on here. So you decide to say, how, how exactly are we going to structure information? And it turns out actually there's, 
there's a number of concepts involved, right? It's not just the tool, but things that we're already familiar with, like knowledge organizations, like classic knowledge organization here. So you decide to say, okay, maybe we want to structure our repository in such a way that we mimic the different schools or departments that we have, right? So how are they structured? Um, maybe Zika at the top level has what? Uh, is it schools of, you have schools, right? What do you call them? Schools, okay. So there's school, right? The normal thing to have under schools would probably be just departments or something, right? I don't know what you have right now. Or units, they're called different things. Like UNSA, UNSA has, UNSA is an interesting, and I think this applies to Zika as well. So UNSA will have immediate under schools, you have, you have two things, you have departments, but you also have uh, other units, right? Um, and then, I mean, maybe this is the thing. Maybe you'd stop at department. I'm not sure. You'd have to decide. Some places will have uh, substructures under department, right? And in fact, maybe this might not be a unit. Is it a directorate or something? I don't know what we can call this. Uzas, is a directorate at the same level of school or? Uh, the directorate and the school. Yeah, so, so you notice this exercise we're going through is what you'd have to go through. But the, 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 the thing with, with this is that there's already a reference point, right? So there's already a structure in place, and so all you have to do is just do a direct mapping. Unless if you want to organize these things differently, but you get to decide, right? So the topmost structure would be your, typically this would be like your community, right? And so the way this space works is, you can only put things in a collection. So you can only upload things in a collection. Meaning that the only place, or for the most part, the only place where you're going to upload content is going to have to be a collection, the lowest structure that you have. So if we decide to say, we're, as Zikas, we're going to stop at department level, what we're saying is that the things that we're going to be ingesting into this space are going to be ingested either in departments or units. If we had other um, like um, substructures here, let's say uh, like UNSA, we don't know with the, I guess now that the Minister of Higher Education, the previous Minister, Professor Lua is no longer around, we don't know if the college thing is going to work out. I don't know if people are aware about the college argument. So what the UNSA, what the proposal from Professor Lua was, at least when she was running the show, was that, uh, was that you'd have um, colleges, right? University colleges, similar to how, I guess, Oxford works or something. I don't know which other entities. And then under each college would have schools, right? Um, and then under these schools, you'd maintain the departments. So you notice that the structure somewhat changed because you have three levels now as opposed to the two that we have currently. Where you just If you look at the UNSA IR right now, school, and then we ingest things into Depart, uh, schools departments, right? So all the things are being put into departments. This is for preprints. But for ETDs, if, for UNSA as well, for ETDs, what we are doing is we have a separate structure, right? We, we are saying we are going to have a community called electronic thesis and dissertations, right? And then within this community, what we've decided to do is we have schools. Right? So what we are doing with ETDs in, at UNSA right now is we are putting we are ingesting ETDs into schools. When you're browsing content, no one knows that your thesis was done in the Department of Library and Information Science. The only thing they know is that it's associated with the School of Education. Again, that is a decision that UNSA made. An option would have been to say, sure, for ETDs we'll have a separate community called ETDs, but what we shall do is Instead of putting things into schools, we shall create a separate, so this would be a community, sub-community, and then we'll have collections that map onto departments. And then we'll still be putting things into departments. I don't know how helpful that would be. I do, I do believe it would be helpful. It's a pity that the, uh, the UNSA DSPES thing is 
down for some weird reason. I think it's been down. Even uh, sorry, it was five or Okay. We don't wanted to show you how it's Okay, so, so the other thing though, right, is as you are... Yeah, we don't know what's happening here. And these are things to avoid. I guess usually the custodians are libraries, right? But the technical expertise normally would come from the unit that handles IT things. Unless if you're a sort of entity that has a system librarians, I think that's the direction we're headed towards as, as UNSA, I don't know. Uh, so you have to make sure you constantly check and if there's something wrong, you call IT, CICT, it's down, right, why? Uh, but if, you, if, if we look at, we can use the UCT as an example, you notice that the structure is somewhat similar to what we are using, so we are mimicking, it's similar to the UNSA, what, what UCT is doing is they have communities top level communities that represent different content that they produce. So research output would be like preprints and book chapters and books by faculty staff and students sometimes. This is self-explanatory, right? These are like ETDs, masters and PhD manuscripts. And then they also expose open education resources. So teaching materials, for instance. To them, this is an important output, right? Teaching aids and these are, they go in here and then other publications. And then if you, if, you, if you go into the research output um, community, right, this is a community, for instance, you find that uh, under sub-community and collection here, you can get a sense of the structure. So under research output, what they have decided to do is to distinguish between the different publications and represent those as being sub-communities or collections. So they make a distinction between books, book chapters, conference proceedings or conference papers, journal articles and other things, right? This would be like uh, maybe technical reports or something. If we go in, uh, let's say journal articles for instance, hopefully they, oh this is, so, so when you go into journal articles there's no way of knowing where this is coming from, I'm not sure why they decided this. You've noticed that you don't know which school is doing what, right? So they, they're just making a distinction between what type of publication these are preprints, right? So things that are generated by staff. Imagine things that, let's say, people in the list department are producing, right? When they write and publish things, these are the things here. But using this approach or this hierarchical structure, there's no way of knowing which school the, the content is coming from. Except uh, we miss that, uh, not by collection anyway. But uh, it, it appears you can browse by department here, or by faculty. This is interesting, I didn't know about this. Let's see where, how, how it is that you can do this. So you notice that the trick they're using here is they're specifying the department, and uh, I don't know if people have uh, picked up on this. They're, they're, they're not specifying the department and, this, and school using the hierarchical structure, but rather they're taking advantage of Dublin course. So if you, if you, if let's say we we go into oh well, these all collections I wonder let's let's try and check here we could have done it differently as an example so what they've decided to do right is instead of instead of using the dispers the way of structuring content in this space to specify the faculty and the department, what they are using is they're taking advantage of qualified Dublin core. Hmm? So the browsing is coming from this thing here. So the browsing through Center for Higher Education because it's associated with the dc.publisher.faculty element, right? So if you go up here, this thing you're seeing here, uh, when we were here. Uh, So when I said we are interested in browsing in here, right, in faculty, what we were doing actually was browsing using, when you specified which faculty, we are not, we're not using um, the hierarchy, the hierarchy 
specified by this space, but we're using the Dublin core element. I don't know if that makes sense. So, you remember when I said, when you're ingesting something, the first thing you start with is you specify where you're going to put it, which collection. And I wish I could log in into the UCT repository to show this, but I don't think I have access to that. I didn't register an account. But what they're doing is, uh, if you look at what we have here, Okay, using this as an example, right? This paper as an example. You will notice that, uh, I hope we can notice the way it's coming from. The way we know which, which collection, so I just opened this, this paper here, right? The first entry um, under research output. The way we know where it's located is by just opening it on the first page and you can literally check here to see that it's been ingested into the research output community and the journal articles collection. But the question is, how do we know, how have they implemented the repository so that they let people know which faculty, which department is responsible for this article? They're using Dublin Core. But for them to ingest this thing into the repository, the first step they have to do is pick this collection, which is journal articles. And the way they would, they would pick this is, First page. First page, under here you would select, so there would be research output, journal articles. And then you go, you start the submission workflow where you, you start describing the article. So this would be like a new, a new thing we're ingesting into the repository. We specify where it's going to, which collection and which community is going to be used to, um, to hold that particular document or digital object. Once you specify the collection and the community or the collection, sub, community, and the community, depending on what hierarchy you're using, then you start describing the content. Because the hierarchy dictates um, the levels you're going to have to associate to the object. If you are doing this, then you'd have community, sub, community, collection. Right? And then you start describing the, um, you start providing descriptive metadata. Now, I mean, this is pretty self-explanatory. All you're doing here is um, you are specifying Dublin core elements that you want to associate to the object. Author, right? First name, last name. If there are multiple authors, you just press add and then you add the other author. If you've, um, if you've, if you've set up your DSpace in such a way that you want to pick author details from a restricted pool of users, which is highly recommended to avoid errors, what you do is you can look up from the list, right? And you want to do this because sometimes the people typing in names instead of uh, Dali, maybe someone is spelling Dali, so the correct way they'll spell it differently, right? If it's a name that, you know, um, would result in a conflict, um, depending whether you're using American English or British English, you might spell it differently, um, which is why you end up having Names that are the same, but they are, they look like they're the same, but they appear twice because the spelling is somewhat different, you know. Um, and then the usual things, you know, so this is your your title, and we know that uh, with Dublin Core, we do have um, title, right? So as, as a person who understands how this repository works, you know that what you're in fact doing here is specifying the Dublin core elements that you want to associate to the document. Right. Um, and knowing that is important because there are certain fields that will require that you specify the, um, you specify qualified Dublin core, not simple Dublin core. So you have to specify, for instance, which sort of publisher you're referring to. In the case of UCT, what they're doing, like I said, you have what? about two, maybe two or more publishers, there's a publisher dot department, publisher dot faculty. What that means is that when you come here, you'd have to specify the publisher, uh, using qualified Dublin called publisher dot, you know, department and publisher dot faculty. 
so that you end up with this. So that you end up with um, with this, because we can see these things here because we can see all of these things here contributed to the author all the way up to uh, publisher to faculty, publisher to department. You can see all these details because someone went through this submission workflow to specify those details. Right. Um, so the usual thing here, um, I think this is all page one, I think. You notice that, um, in fact, there's a, some sort of breadcrumb here which tells you at what stage of the submission workflow you are, you are at, and I think these map onto the pages. So a typical display submission workflow has about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages that you go through as you're submitting the content. Right, which is why, again, I'm, I'm mentioning all of these things to, to tie to things that we've already discussed. The fact that this process is error-prone error sometimes because it's, it takes a lot of time. The reason why we have few things or we have a backlog of content is because this is a time-consuming task. So processing one digital object is, I don't know how long it takes, but I mean, I know when I'm submitting, last time I submitted something, uh, into the user repository, I think it took me about maybe about five or so minutes, right? But that's because I, like I, I've done this before, so I know. But for someone who doesn't know, you know, it's like time-consuming task. Um, and for someone, in, the people responsible for this in the library, you know, uh, they should be commended. By the way, um, it's it, it even makes it worse because what they have to do is identify things like the subject associated with the document and. For you to identify which subject you want to associate, you need to read the document or part of the document, the abstract. For you to know who the supervisor, well, we don't log the supervisor, I guess. For you to specify the name, you need to copy paste the name or something. I don't know if this makes sense. Anyway. Uh, so this is still page one where you specify this. Obviously, this is the date, right? DC.dat. But if you are using Qualified Dublin Core, you have to specify which date you're referring to. And the reason why you want to specify which date is because Typically, important dates associated with um, a digital object in the repository is things like when the, the artifact was published and when it was ingested into the repository, or if there are any other dates associated with it. Which is why, if we look at um, this thing here, it has a, a repeatable date field, right? Date available and date issued. Okay, and then you know publishers and some of these things again depending on what sort of decisions you've made as an organization or as an entity you could choose to leave out some of these things perhaps you might decide to say you know what the citation field is not important for us the series name these are not important things so um, as part of the procedures the process and procedures that you'd set up you tell whoever is responsible to say I'm sure hopefully there's a manual at UNSA which spells out uh, what to do as you're working through this if you're submitting content in the library so whenever you come across a citation field, just leave it blank, it's fine, right? And we can get away with that because Dublin Core is uh, optional. Yep, so identifiers are coming back. We discussed identifiers, uh, importance of identifiers. Again, um, you have the option to repeat this field because you could potentially have more than one identifier. Maybe you, dis you, you might decide as an entity to specify an identifier that uh, ensures local uniqueness of digital objects, right? One that um, ensures global uniqueness. So if you're using DOIs, I guess you could, or handles, you could do that. Or you could just adopt a typical URL if you want to, which is what we do as UNSA. Um, the other reason why you might want to repeat this is because if you're dealing with uh, content such as preprints, this thing could be published elsewhere. So if, if, if it's been submitted elsewhere by a faculty staff and what you are ingesting is a preprint, you want to tell people that are going to be accessing this content to say it's published elsewhere implicitly by specifying the DOI, for instance, for where it's located, right? So if it's a journal, you're pointing to um, the DOI associated with the journal that is currently holding that actual published document, right? Um, if it's in a print-based um, print um, publication venue, like, uh, like, a, like is the case at UNSA where most of the journals are print-based, you just specify the ISSN number of the journal, right? The other things people can infer, like you, the number of pages where it appears, 
right? And then someone, for someone to access this, this thing here, they would have to have a physical copy of the journal itself. And, and you might be wondering then, why, why bother the ISSN if, if you are ingesting that thing in the, um, in the repository? It turns out that some publishers have restrictions, right? They will, they will tell you to say you're not allowed to archive any preprints or postprints of what you've published elsewhere. Or if it's a print-based venue, what you'd have to do is scan it, but if you, if you haven't scanned it, what you can do, it turns out, is you can specify descriptive information about the content without necessarily associating the bit stream. So you just, and it's quite common, I don't know if people have come across this, what you do as you're going through the submission workflow is you specify the metadata, but you don't upload the actual document. For someone to access the document, they would have to refer to maybe the print-based journal, the actual original journal, right? Something that's common. Um, Okay, I think something I, I was just trying to showcase this uh, saving a, a submission workflow for later here, right? But, so the second page really it's still descriptive information that you're specifying, but different kinds here. Um, so the infamous keywords are back, right? So you just set keywords, um, link to the publication itself. Abstract, always important, right? Um, if there are people that provided funding, um, that contributed to the overall success of that particular publication, you indicate their details here. Right? As is the case for most research, it's funded usually, maybe money is coming in from government or donors and whatnot, you specify their details here. Um, and again, the reason you might want to do this is maybe it's a funding uh, requirement, say, whatever publication you produce, you must specify that we're a part of these things, so provided funding. But I just wanted to kind of point out and point out the fact that when it comes to subjects, right, you have the option of either specifying the subjects by just manually typing the, the subjects or the tags themselves, or you can look up the associated tags from like a lookup table, so a controlled vocabulary set, which is recommended by the way, right? Um, it's recommended because it, it actually ensures that browsing becomes more effective for a repository. And what I mean is if you if you go to the, if you go to, let's say, the UCT repository, and I want to browse content, I'm, I'm here and I'm looking for content in the UCT repository, I know there's a lot of stuff here, maybe 30,000 plus um, uh, objects, right? But I'm just interested in a particular subject area, maybe it's uh, information science, for instance, how do I do that? I could search, right? There's an option to search here, which happens to be one of the services integrated with typical digital library, right? search and browse. If you remember those services, part of the service layer. But, but it turns out that some people would prefer to browse content, right? So you browse content by subject, um, and then you narrow down to a specific subject that you, you're interested in. Now, if, if you don't associate proper tags to, to your object, then then the, the number of subjects that people get to see here will be so many, right? Because you won't be consistent. And typically you, you end up not being consistent when you're not using a controlled vocabulary set. Instead of having someone, the, the person who is going through this submission workflow, to, uh, let's say we are ingesting uh, some sources, uh, dissertation for instance, and maybe high interest is in records management, right? If, it's, if we're not using a controlled vocabulary, there, there's a likelihood that maybe the person who is processing this ETD in the library might not know that one of the proper ways of associating a subject to this um, manuscript would be to tag it with the word records management, right? Not only that, but what could also potentially happen if you are not putting information from a controlled vocabulary set is instead of spelling records management like this, maybe they'll make a mistake and just say it's record management or something. You understand? So the thing with the controlled vocabulary set is you're number one trying to make sure that you associate predefined text to an object. Number two, you're trying to prevent errors because errors do happen. They always happen when you have people typing in free text. Errors happen, right? 
So you'd much rather pull information from a controlled set. Um, we, we don't do that uh, at UNSA. Now, I don't know why the, ah, it's back. We don't do that at UNSA, and this is what uh, the group of smart uh, fourth year students we're working with are doing. What, what they're trying to do is trying to figure out if, um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, and I'm going back and forth. So you see that these are duplicates, the three we wanted to check for, right? The three TDs. so it's not like uh, this person, uh, Mary Banda did a master's and a PhD at UNSA, or two master's and one PhD. This is the same document appearing three times. You see that same year, right, same title. Um, uh, oh, three documents actually, I don't know. Maybe one of them could be a master's, one of them is a PhD, but you have two duplicates here. First one, the second one. So what I was saying with controlled vocabulary set here is um, if you and I hope we'll be able to see this. If we try and browse the different subjects, uh, we can already see here, and I wanted to see if we could hopefully. The first thing that tells you that is, for all the ETDs that we have, this is like a 4,000 plus ETDs, right? What we are saying is that we have a total of 3,405 subjects associated to like 4,000 ETDs. Does not make sense, right? If you're using a controlled vocabulary set, what you expect is that everyone who graduates from lease will be reusing the same tags over and over again. Do you understand this? Right, in this group, there are people maybe will be interested in records management and God knows what else, digital libraries, collection development, but you won't stray away from, from this restricted set of, of fields, right? Subfields, right? Um, so if we, if we were to maybe look at the 100 things here. Uh, ah, perfect example. See the problem here, right? This is the same thing, but it's appearing twice because someone, the first person who was entering these things decided to use a, an, an en dash, so two, two hyphens. Then the other person here used one hyphen. So it appears like it's two things. If you are using a controlled vocabulary set, you would avoid this because you'd be picking information from a predefined set. Drop down, select, instead of typing, right? So, and there are many such, such things that you probably come across, things like uh, different casing being used and, uh, you know, things that you think, things that should be the same, right? If HIV infection and HIV AIDS, I mean, to me, it's be like collapse into one, right? But that's just me anyway. Um, you know, so, you know, gender, Zambia, gender, HIV infection appeared somewhere up there, but it's, it's, the casing is different, I guess. It's using uppercase I, uh, if you remember, lowercase I, right? So these are all things that you can avoid um, if you're using a controlled vocabulary set, right? So something to think about. Um, and really implementing this is not that hard. The, the, the difficult thing, which is what these fourth year students are doing, is deciding or identifying which controlled vocabulary sets you're going to use. Right, so it has to be systematic. You just can't say we're going to use a controlled vocabulary set, but which sets are going to use? Because you have to take into account the fact that, like, an entity like the UNSA has a number of fields, right? So people in education use different controlled vocabulary sets from people in natural sciences, people in engineering, right? And in fact, if you look at education, you have lists in here. People in lists use different controlled vocabulary sets. People in adult education use different vocabulary sets. People in engineering, you have mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, right? So, I mean, these are all things um, to think about, take into account if you want to implement this. But once you implement it, it makes life a lot easier because what people will be doing here is just identifying where you want to pick controlled vocabulary sets from. So, uh, education would appear here and then this would appear as like a subcategory and then you just pull the, the um, things from there. Right, and then the third, the third page here is you're just specifying, um, I don't know if people remember this class of metadata we're specifying here, anything to do with uh, Things like embargoes and copyright issues. Are we on copyright? No, it's access issues. Do, do we, are we able to identify which sort of metadata we're dealing with here? This is, I mean, this is a given here. This is descriptive, right? But anything to do with access, what is, what, what type of metadata is this? I don't know if people remember. We have uh, descriptive metadata, we have uh, 
structural metadata, we have uh, administrative metadata, right? This is administrative metadata. So what we're doing here is uh, associating, potentially we have the option to associate um, access restrictions to the content that we're ingesting. It turns out that uh, there are certain use cases where you might want to prevent access to an object, right? So you associate some sort of embargo and you specify a period within which that thing is going to be embargoed. So no one will have access to it until you get to that point in time. This is very common for people that uh, come up with patents, right? So if you're doing a dissertation and one of the outputs is like a patent, um, before you finish the whatever legal issues associated with that patent you want, you don't want people to see the dissertation because they have access to the idea behind what you did, right? So you embargo it. Right? It's still in the repository, but there's an embargo associated with it and it only become available um, once you pass through the period in time. And then you specify the reason why it's embargoed, right? Um, you know, um, then, so, so indicating that this thing is private, for instance, we ensure that no one can actually search for it. Um, other reasons why you might want to, to indicate that a particular object is private is, uh, there's a use case that the library, I don't know if they've done this, but a while back we had interacted with the library and they were wanting to, to make the exams private because right now they are public. The argument was that uh, the content should actually only be accessible to people that have a registered account, so like students. Uh, if you're a student and you've been, uh, an account has been created for you, you will have access to the exam. But everybody else out there, like someone from Zika's or Unilas or uh, Copper Belt University, should they really have access to the exams? Maybe, maybe not. That's a decision you'd have to make as, as an entity, as an organization, I suppose. What sort of content you want to expose to the public? What content you want to restrict access to? Right. Um, so, but you do this by specifying um, access restrictions. Right. It's simple as just saying tick. This is a private item. So, peop when people search for search in the repository, it won't it won't appear as a search result because it's pri pri private. Um, and then finally, well, not finally, but uh, page number four, I guess you specify the actual bitstream, right? The PDF or the video or the audio that you want to associate this metadata with. Yes? Yes. Oh, they can't. It's, it's, uh, no, well, it's, it's probably, uh, if they're using this space, uh, we, can do, we can check actually instead of speculating. If they're using this space, hmm, they have a very nice name, Mac IR, right? Instead of us, we're using a generic this space. <laughs> Please, uh, as Zikas, don't say this space to Zikas, to, you know, your branding is important, right? Oh, it's this space, thank goodness. So if we, and by the way, when we're coming up with the structure, right, if, as Zikas, if you want to come up with a repository, a nice starting point is going out there and looking, look, look, be on the lookout for what you think are repositories that are properly structured, look at how they are structuring content, and then do an evaluation, which structure makes sense, right? And then you just replicate what they have here. So Macquarie University, oh, they have colleges, right? Uh, I don't know where the ETDs are here. Do you remember where they are? They're in the individual colleges, maybe. Uh, so we'll just check for ETDs in, in here. I wonder where this is. I'm sure this falls under at Makerere. No, at Makerere, maybe information sciences. They have a college of, there should be a list here. Computing and, yeah, there we go. It's a misnomer in this university to have lists in education. I think it's a legacy issue. I mean, it's, um. Most places will have it under HSS, actually, right? It's either HSS or you link it to maybe computing or engineering or something, so, but it doesn't matter, right? Um, so you're saying if we access one of these things here, oh, but it's here, right? Maybe you looked at one sample, 
Oh, let's, let's see. Master's thesis. So it could be the case that the content you are trying to download was embargoed then. Yeah. Or was said to be private for whatever reason. Um, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. So. Ah. Now let's see if they're doing. Oh, they do it like Unza, right? Is this supervisor details? Oh, this is a supervisor page, right? On this page two. But no examiners here. Huh? Different ways of doing things. Anyway. Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. There we go. Yeah, so it's a. Uh, so, <laughs> no, but, but I've always thought, you know, that uh, people have spoken to my colleagues and I tell them the size of the university. You know, we have 850, 850 plus staff, academic staff, by the way. Um, you know, uh, full time students, uh, total students is almost 30,000, including these other programs and long uh, distance students, right? Um, and we're at the same level as most of these institutions. I think we just haven't. There are certain things that we haven't figured out how to do right, right? Uh, I don't think this is a very difficult thing to do. It's just a matter of just sitting down and coming up with a plan on how you're going to effectively deposit things into the repository, right? This shouldn't be that hard. I mean, we can do this, but anyway, it's my career. The challenge we have is um, people want to be felt. People want to be... They want to sign and all the papers and everything. Right. So you discover that someone has got 1,000 and 10,000 things to do. Yeah. But they still insist things should come to my office. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I see they include the uh, computer numbers here of student so ID. This one is 2018 December. And you can see it on. Uh, Yes, yeah. <laughs> so the the, th the thing with certain places like the way Zika's works, I, and I I know my experience was from years like to 2013, but they were quite. Uh, Serious with things there. I think the way things run there. I mean, as in serious, I mean, things don't take a lot of time. Like implementation is almost instantaneous, right? Not where you complain that a, a socket is not working. It would take three months, right? Like last year, the venue, right? There's no power there. What do we do? You know, you have to report people. That's when they say we reported and they're not doing this. That's when they work. But but so, I mean, it's, um, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. Uh, but we can certainly do what my career is doing. Like I'm looking at this most recent dissertation again. And here we go. Let's see if their handle, I think their handle works because this is the repository ID 10, 10570. So if we click on that, it should be able to work without a problem. Um, I hope we have access to it's loading, but anyway, we can wait for it, and then I'm sure it will come up as we proceed here. But the the, the way you know it uh, it works is if if you're not using the default one two three four five six seven eight nine, which we have at least. Okay, uh, so I mean the usual things here. Uh, um, description of the file if you want to provide the description. Again, if you um, um, if you've embargoed the, the PDF document as well, here it's a metadata, I guess. Um, so you specify those details here. Um, and then finally, right, once you upload the document, is one, two, three, page number four. Page number five is you, you are given the opportunity to review the, the information that you've associated with the document, right? So you're given the chance to edit things. If you notice that there the are mistakes that you've made, maybe typos and whatnot, you can correct these things. Um, and the reason you might want to do this is at this point you haven't yet indexed the, the document, right? So someone searching for, let's say, tutorial 
um, will not see this document because it hasn't, the changes haven't yet been committed. Um, the thing with editing the document after you've ingested, after you've committed the changes is, is that you have to re-index it so that um, the correct thing is indexed. Um, so you're presented with this page where you just see the things that you've done here. Um, and then you specify uh, whatever licensing you want to associate to the document. So again, this is specific to an organization. For ETDs, for most places, uh, the student, um, I, I don't know if the, this applies to the ones, but the student, the author has copyright access to the document, right? So like in my case, what I decided to use, so all my, my master's and PhD, my PhD thesis and master's dissertation are all uh, released under Creative Commons attribution license, right? Vision 4.0. Uh, and so the person that is ingesting this thing would have to specify the licensing, right? There are predefined uh, licensing uh, that come bundled with this space, but you can add more if you wish to. Um, yeah, and then just a distribution license where this is generic stuff that you can change as an organization if you want to, right? Um, and the reason why you'd want the person who is ingesting this content to agree to this license is you want to make sure that they're uploading legal copies of documents here, right, into the repository. Um, and then done, the submission process is done, you complete it, and then um, you're given the option to go to the initial submission page to submit a new document. So if you're in the library, right, uh, make no mistake, this process takes time. We'll try it out on Wednesday, you'll see this. Um, so if you're in the library, you've done, this is maybe you've reported for work at eight, you, by 8.20 you're done with this, or 8.30 or something, or maybe 8.40 or something. You are done, you go to the first, to the initial submission page, you start the whole process over again with a new document, right? Um, but if you are someone, let's say faculty staff and um, you're self-archiving the document, you only get to do this maybe three times, four times in a year, right? Um, just because. Um, and then done, right? So um, once you go back to the submission page, uh, you get to see what you've submitted like in this case and unfinished submissions. Uh, and then what I was showcasing here is uh, the fact that once you submit the document, it's automatically indexed in the background. So once you're done with the submission, actually you can log in anonymously to try and see if, if the document has actually been, if the changes have actually been committed, if it's been indexed, if you can access it. It's always a good idea to do that. Um, if you follow the, for my IRA manager, he normally, he, uh, I like what he does, he normally, on his Facebook page, right? Um, I don't know if I should show you this is important. Oh, my career university is, has not implemented handles as well. Uh, it's, it's not working, right? I don't know where they came up with that handles. It's never. I just want to show you something that, um, uh, I follow um, Mr. Zulu. I hope this works. Um, what, what he, I like what he does, right? So if you see this, what he does is every time there's a new item, he shares it. I mean, granted, I, I don't know how many of his friends would be interested in this, right? Um, maybe they are. Uh, but he shares, he shares uh, what has been submitted here. So. This only happens once you finish the submission, right? Um, so every time you find this, this stream has a whole bunch of things that have been sub submitted in the repository. Incidentally, this comes in as a value added, uh, if, if you remember under services, we said you can have value added services, right? So there's usually like, a, a, I guess, a, an extension that you can install that allows you to share a repository object to Twitter or to Facebook or whatever pl other platform you want to. And you soon see that other um, protocols that are available or that you can integrate these repositories with allow you to actually syndicate content to let's say a website. So instead of having users to, to go to your website, like the UNSA right now, you go to the UNSA website and then there's a link that says institutional repository, you click on the link. What you can do is within the website itself, 
um, you install the necessary plugin, there are plugins for Drupal and WordPress, and then you link the website to the repository in such a way that you are pulling content automatically, so content is listed on your website. Very uh, nice feature, by the way, that people tend to miss. Okay, uh, so content has been indexed, and incidentally, the next topic is indexing, so we get a sense of how indexing works, which is really an important, I guess, an important topic, in my opinion. Um, and then, this page is just showing us um, things that we've looked at already. So this is like a full, I'm viewing, we are viewing the full metadata associated with the object that we have just ingested, right? You notice that there's qualified Dublin core tags here. dc.contributor.author, action date, available date, issue date, right? Identifier, yeah? Um, I was just trying to highlight the fact that uh, we had dec decided to associate um, our own local identifier, right? Where we have uh, a short form of our institution, the course, and the year, and whatnot. Um, description and all these different things. And then we, it so happens that we decided to associate a Creative Commons license to this particular example document here. Okay, I, I don't know if this makes sense here. I mean, the link between um, the 15 Dublin core elements, the um, associated qualified Dublin core tags, and how you get to describe or provide descriptive information within DSpace, a platform like DSpace, using those tags. Bearing in mind that we do know that there are other metadata schemes that we could potentially um, integrate or use, but we just decided to focus on Dublin Core because it happens to be one of the most uh, popular um, metadata schemes, right? So we, we now have an idea of how Dublin Core is linked to um, a repository like this place, for instance. Um, incidentally, if you go to, if you use really easy to use platforms like Omeka or ePrints, they also use Dublin Core by default. That's how popular it is, that's how flexible, um, or that's how effective people are. I guess it's, a, it's an indicator of how effective something is. If more people are using it, then there has to be something special about it. Right? Um, I think the fact that it's generic also. If, if, if we decided to come up with a repository that is solely um, aimed at archiving or storing teaching materials, for instance, we wouldn't use Dublin Core, right? We would use instead something like LOM because it's specific for learning objects, right? Learning object metadata. Um, if, if one of the byproducts of what you're wanting to do is uh, coming up with a, an indigenous knowledge database or repository, then you'd have to identify an appropriate metadata scheme to use. You probably wouldn't want to set up a Dublin call, right? Incidentally, right? I mean, whatever it is, you might eventually store uh, tied to indigenous knowledge. Maybe it's like, uh, I don't know, sayings or something, local languages. I don't know, maybe it's a, a description of what sort of medicine is used and whatnot. Um, what you'd be storing here is not PDFs, right? It would be like uh, maybe audios, maybe videos, right? Um, so you notice that it's, what I'm trying to say is, even though our, our case here is mostly concerned with um, institutional repositories, but these things we are calling digital libraries transcend different disciplines or domains, right? So you, you can use this to, to archive uh, cultural heritage information. You know, videos, audio, you know. Um, Okay, so if there are no questions, then I guess we proceed and start our discussion of um, um, these things I call interoperability, uh, interoperability protocols, right? Um, so it turns out that um, because, because these platforms don't really work in isolation, because there could be instances when you might want other people or other platforms to access the content that you have in the repository, then there has to be a way in which you expose the digital objects, right? This is why uh, things like interoperability protocols are important, right? Not only that, um, there are instances when you might want your users to deposit content into the repository, not by using the DSpace instance itself, but maybe by using a different type of application. For them to be able to interact with the repository, they need 
um, the repository needs to, in, to expose some sort of uh, interface, a protocol, right? Have a provision for them to be able to do that. Right? This is why uh, interoperability protocols are important. So some, some example protocols that you typically have um, integrated with or repositories or digital libraries, or things like a session retrieval via URL or SRU protocol. What this does is it facilitates remote searching. So instead of you logging on to the DSpace instance to issue a search query, you can do that remotely, right, using this protocol. The, the beauty with this is you can actually do your searching using a third party application and still get the results. The same results you would get if you did your searching from within the repository. Um, a classic protocol that is used is, another classic protocol used is, um, this is not that common, but SOD is very common. I think the, the SOD, SOD has gone up to version three now. <clears throat> what SOD does is um, it facilitates remote ingestion or deposit of content. So right now, our discussion has led us to a point in time when we, we sort of like think or feel as though the only way we can deposit content into the repository is by logging in, going to the, like in this case, going to a Unza repository, log in, and then you go through this submission workflow. But with a protocol such as SOD, what you can do is you can have people implement a separate application, right? Maybe a desktop-based application similar to Microsoft Word, the way Microsoft Word works. So that application will be installed on a local machine. And then that application will, will, still, will still do what the submission workflow does, but then it's done using an independent application. And then once the person specifies all the required information, they use SOD to actually deposit the content remotely, right? So remotely in that you're not depositing the content using the repository itself, but you're doing it implicitly. You're using a third party application to send the content through. I don't know if that makes sense. So, so the, the potential value of these are endless actually. So instead of forcing people to use this space, what you can do is you can implement an application that mimics the uh, most popular applications that you, people use. Maybe you can come up with a web, web browser plugin, right, that facilitates remote deposit. I don't know if people have used plugins for, uh, like Chrome plugins that allow you to do certain things, right? I don't know. No? Mendeley has a plugin, a web browser plugin, it's called a bookmarklet, where as you're browsing, when you come across a publication that you're interested in, you just say, add to Mendeley. What that does is, within the browser, you can do the same thing that, that you would do with Mendeley Desktop, right? So with Mendeley Desktop, for me to add content to my library, I have to download the PDF document, and then I'll say, oh, add, add the document here. And then specify the file and, and, and the metadata associated with the, with the document, yeah? But with the bookmarklet, as I'm browsing, if I come across an article like this, and I want to add it to Mendeley, all I'll do is use the bookmarklet to say, add to Mendeley, and I have it right here. You see this? Uh, let me see if I can work. I hope it works. I have to sign into Mendeley, but you get the point, right? So, the, so what, what I have here is, this is a, it's a browser plugin, it's a piece of software that does the same thing that I would do with the Mendeley application, but I don't have to open up the Mendeley application to do this. Because I'm already in the browser, I might as well make, take advantage of the browser, right? So the same concept would be used with um, an application implemented to, to interface a repository with the sort protocol. Instead of depositing using the DSpace repository itself that has been installed by Unza, I'll just use like a third party application. That makes my life a lot easier. It's about convenience, by the way. I mean, it's, you want to make it as easy as possible for people to add content to the repository in this case. <clears throat> um, RSS, I think we've come across RSS feeds, right? This is given. It turns out it's a service. Uh, most websites, like Lusaka Times, will have an RSS feed, right? So you, you can 
Um, I don't know if people use that. What it does is it will probably list uh, the top 10, top five most recent articles. It's a feed, and the beauty with that is uh, you have third party applications as well, so I can install an Android app that, um, um, that sort of like uses an RSS feed, and instead of me logging into Lusaka Times, I will use the Android app to see updates coming in from Zambian Watchdog, Moaban 2, Lusaka Times in one unified platform. And I can do that because of this protocol, right? It's because of RSS feed. Um, I mean, we read so many, like I'm using news as an example here, but there's so many um, platforms where we pull information from, right? So we might as well collectively view everything from one source. Same goes for repositories. Maybe you'd want to pull resources from multiple repositories so that you see updates of content coming in from there whatever use case you might have. Um, another example is um, typically most of the such applications will be integrated with a REST API. Um, again, what this does is it allows you to build third party applications that will ensure that you interact with the repository in an effective manner, right? Um, some of the features that are provided by um, REST APIs will typically do what sort protocol and search and retrieval via URL would typically do, but in one, sort of like one unified way, I guess. Um, and then because there are so many protocols, I always, maybe we should have chosen SOAD as a case, but we'll focus our attention on the OIPMH protocol just because it happens to be one of the most widely used protocols when it comes to digital libraries, right? Um, so what it does really is facilitates um, harvesting of metadata, right? <clears throat> so using the OIPMH protocol, what you do is you can programmatically pull information, descriptive information associated with the digital, live, uh, digital objects in that repository. So in the case of UNSA, however many objects we have right now, if we we are faced with a situation where we wanted to pull all the descriptive information associated with the things we have in the user repository. A nice way of doing that would be to use the OAI PMH protocol. We are looking at 5,000 plus objects, right? So how do you pull them? Not only that, maybe you might be interested in just pulling ETDs from the School of Education. Instead of you going to the repository, um, a repository like this and then saying, oh, I'll go to the uh, thesis and dissertation and then I will go to the education collection. Instead of manually getting those details, you can pull them all at once using the OIPMH protocol. I think this thing is not working as well. It's very unfortunate. Okay, but, but when it comes to integration, by the way, there's more, right? So there's more things, and if, if you feel like you're adventurous, you can um, look up on uh, uh, specific, uh, other specific things um, integrated with DSpace, for instance, seeing as we're using DSpace as a case here. Uh, increasingly, and I just remember this because, uh, is it, uh, it comes out or something was telling me, he came to see me, ah, but, uh, Joseph actually was saying this. Um, yeah. um, okay, I don't know if people have heard of this, right? People are increasingly talking about this. Oh no, I was submitting the paper and then they told me I should specify my ORCID ID or something. Is it open researcher and contribute ID? Um, it turns out because because of the sheer number of things, this is one of the things that you'd find integrated with uh, a typical repository these days, by the way. I thought we'd talk about this as a breather, I guess, because we've been talking for a long time. Um, it turns out that because of the sheer number of things that we are producing like, during our era, everybody's writing now, right? I mean, um, think of the number of ETDs, for instance, produced at UNSA, or the number of publications at UNSA, Zikas, Murungushi, and that's just Zambia, right? The US, you look at South Africa, Uganda. Uganda doesn't have just Makere University, other universities, right? The, the, one of the challenges that comes up is how do you how do you identify how do you identify who exactly is responsible for 
the publication. You're not the only Dalis Otembo, are you? I mean, there's bound to be a Dalis Otembo, maybe at CBU, potentially doing lease, right? How do we know it's you, right? It turns out people have come up with a way of doing that. A unique identifier to identify authors, right? Uh, this is more prevalent, by the way, for females where, you know, typically when you get married, you start hyphenizing your name and then your name changes, right? So if you're using your name, then you have things coming in from two names, right? Uh, so there's, there's like a, increasing need to uniquely identify authors, right? So you find uh, repositories like this that's being integrated with uh, ORCID, what they call ORCID. Please is, uh, create an ORCID ID. You can do this easily. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't. I have an ORCID ID myself. Um, so what, what these repositories will do is they'll pull information from your ORCID ID, I guess. Uh, Uh, yeah, it's just a service, really, um, similar to a handle or DOI, where everybody who registers has a unique ID, and then that unique ID is used to identify you as a researcher. Um, so you notice they'll boast, these people will boast things like, right now they have a total of uh, six, almost seven million unique ORCID IDs that have been registered. So these are like researchers from around the world. Uh, you probably want to create this. I mean, it's always nice. You won't lose a thing. It's free, anyway. But um, <clears throat> anyway, so what I was trying to say is there's more things that are there, but these are some of the most widely or commonly used um, protocols, I guess, that you come across. So I, th I thought now would be a good time for us to transition to start talking about the OIPMH protocol um, for metadata harvesting. So OIPMH stands for Open Archives Protocol for Metadata Harvesting. Um, and simply put, I mean, it's, it's essentially used to exchange information, specifically metadata between, between two different archives. So if we decided to say we want, and this is something that we sh I think I'll talk about towards the end, if we wanted to, to we decided to say, we, we want, what we want to start doing is we, we are creating a consortium between UNSA and Zikas, and one of the things we are going to do is all ETDs that are generated at Zikas and at UNSA are going to be located in a central portal somewhere. But you realize that Zikas will have their own repository where they're depositing things, UNSA has their own repository. So the question is how do we merge the two, right? You take advantage of protocols such as OIPMH, right? So with OIPMH you can just uh, pull the content from Zikas and from Unza. And then they'll just appear in one central central location. This is like the premise of, of the OIPMH um, protocol. Remember that what you're pulling here is the descriptive information. You're not getting the Bitstream, the PDF in this case. You would not be getting the PDF, but just the metadata, right? Um, and the way this protocol works really is quite, and also I think it's is common, right? I'm sure it's been discussed maybe, but uh, somewhere. Why PMH? In one of the courses maybe, no? I think so, no? It turns out that it's so popular that uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Koha also implements this. So uh, in case people are, you know, Koha. Is this how you spell Koha? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, there we go. Most of these platforms, um, most of these digital library platforms actually will, will implement the OIPMH protocol. So uh, a Koha instance will probably have uh, an OIPMH data provider, right? So a way in which you can pull information that you are putting into Koha using OIPMH. Okay, so the way it works, right, it works in a very simple way. There's just a total of six verbs, so a way of accessing this information. 
right? So there's a way, there's an identify verb. We see how to access these verbs. There's a list metadata formats verb. There's a list set verb. There's a list identify verb, list record verb, and the get record verb. Right, so this is just a way of accessing the information in the repository itself. Um, right, so the, and I wonder why this is, so the identify verb does nothing more than uh, return identifying information about the repository itself. Uh, so once you, you use the OIPMH protocol, right, this is just an example using the UNSA repository, this is how you issue the call. Um, it's, it's essentially just a URL, you specify a URL, and that URL has uh, details of the, the best URL for the repository, um, and, and a specific way of specifying that particular verb, right? So the syntax for this specific, specific this specific, you notice that other repositories like Omeka and ePrints and Greenstone will have a different way of, they've implemented this protocol differently, right? Um, so in this case, the identifier verb just lists information about that repository. So, if we wanted to pull, if we wanted to check identifying information uh, for, let's say, the Makerere University, and I didn't know about Makerere, the Makerere University thing, but I'll go there. Uh, just now so that we see, I don't know where we put it. Gone. Oh, it's here. If they've implemented this the correct way, then OAI request. Hmm. With me. Uh, I just wanted to, sh to show you, I, I want us to look at, uh, uh, I want us to look at the a different, um, a different repository. Mm. Oh, there we go. I thought I did this. What did I do wrong? I don't know. Oh, they haven't. They haven't for some for whatever reason this is not coming up. I don't know why. Probably. No. Anyway, uh, maybe the UCT one will work. Hopefully, it should work. Just to show us uh, um, how how it appears like for for other. Um, the, the type of information that you have. So you notice that what UCT has is similar to what we checked for the UNSA. So the identify verb does nothing more than uh, show you, and I can't keep track of, I'll close this. That. Not too many things open here. So again, I mean, it's just identifying information. So things like uh, if someone is, this might be important for, like if someone is looking for contact details for the person responsible for the repository. I don't know if what we have for the ones is the correct information. Um, but the sort of um, format, the naming format you're using to identify your, to specify your identifiers. So global uniqueness, how is it implemented? They are showing us here because this is a sample identifier, right? Um, the version of uh, OIPMH that you're using, um, the latest date. I don't, I don't know what this date is, though. I have to check. Earliest registration date. I don't know what this is. 1994 sounds like so sounds like recent. I have to check what this is. I don't know if it's accurate. And then the name of the repository, obviously. Uh, like in this case, uh, we're calling it open space, whatever that means. Clearly, they haven't really, the, the identifier is wrong here. It's not localhost. I need to change this, but anyway. 
So you notice that this is uh, similar to what we have here, right? Um, you can see a sample identifier and all that. You can do the same thing with the with the other list subject repository that I've been talking about uh, archive, which is this. You should have a way I request the identifier of this work. I don't know if it's going to work, but not that it matters. So it's, it's identifying information, right? Um, and then the other verb that you have is uh, the least metadata format. So what what this remember I said six. What this does is it um, it tells whoever is interested in using this um, whoever is interested in putting information the different metadata schemes that you can use to extract information from the repository. Right. So um, even though our discussion has been restricted to Dublin Core, what platforms like DSpace will allow you to do is to get the descriptive information of the metadata using different metadata schemes or formats. So if I was extracting electronic theses and dissertations from the UNSA repository, instead of using Dublin Core, what I could decide, or what, could, what I could have used is extract information using ETDMS, because I know that ETDMS is a format that is specific to ETDs. Right. Um, so you have the whole list of, let me see if we can get to the user repository and, yeah. What's your, metadata oh, metadata scheme, is that the name of the, sorry. So ETD, is that an example of, uh, ETDMS is uh, just the name of the metadata scheme itself. So it, it's called it ETDMS. You can look it up. It's, it's a specific scheme for electronic thesis and dissertations, actually. It's like a well-established kind of standard. Um, the people behind this, are, I don't know if people have heard of uh, the NDLTD consortium, so NDLTD, Network Digital Library of NDLTD, Network Digital Library of Thesis and Dissertations. Um, they came up with ETDMS. Implementation has been slow, you know, um, but they try to enforce it in portals like this. So, so again, I don't know if people have heard about this. If you're doing, when you're doing your literary review, you're bound to come across the NDOTD Union Archive. What this does is it uses OIPMH, the OIPMH protocol, to get electronic theses and dissertations from around the world, right? So this is like a list of universities around the world. The people behind these are the NDOT, NLTD, N, NDOTD. And you notice that currently what these people have done is um, they've collected a total of, these are masters and PhD dissertations and theses, a total of about six million of them, right? For however long, however long depends on how long the the people they're putting information for have been uploading their dissertations. Yes, UNSA is not here because you need to you need to explicitly tell them say add us and they have a certain core requirements, right? Um, <clears throat> so you find uh, Yale is there, you know, um, University of Toronto, and it shows you this is a simple list. There's also a search. Um, there's a browse service. This is just showing you statistics, but there's also a browse uh, NDO. If you go to the NDO TD page, in case you're feeling adventurous, by the way, you'll find um, um, an option where you get to specify browse, 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 list of members. Global ETD search. So there's this search portal where, again, the same things you are seeing here, right? The same things we are seeing here. This 5,000 and 5,851,000, 5,851,908 dissertations that are there so far. You can browse for them here, yeah? So you see this number should be almost the same anyway. So with this browse service, you can just, if I search for Zambia, <coughs> um, what my search, 
yields is a list of all dissertations that have mentioned Zambia somehow. I mean, yeah, so from around the world, right? So you have like hits here. Is, uh, you can browse for content and, you know, I don't know if this makes sense. But the key thing here is that all of this is possible because of the protocol we we're just discussing, right? And, and what is actually happening here is what we discussed as being um, um, the kind of things that happen here. So this is machine to machine interaction. So as, as that, that service, as you are searching in that service, you can see those results because there's, the software is implemented in such a way that on regular intervals, it goes to all of those different universities and searches for new content. If it finds new content, it pulls the metadata and then it indexes them within that platform. The pulling of the metadata is possible because of machine to machine interaction. And because the, the software itself is pulling information using the OAI PMH data provider on that repository. Right? So when Zcash implements a repository, you just tell um, the, the NDOTD to say, we want you to add Zcash to the list as well, and then they will add you there, and then people will be able to search for content. Um, and the, the reason really, and people will say, well, but why? Why, why, is, why do we even bother, right? Visibility, right? And visibility means rankings, right? So if you're obsessed with rankings, you want to make sure that you're visible, you know? If you're not part of what everybody else is doing, people won't take you seriously, you know? But um, I don't know if I'm making sense. Not only that, so one of the things I'll, I'll speak about is uh, something we've been, it's taken too long, but something we've been trying to do where we are taking advantage of the same protocol, but what we, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but what we are wanting to do is, uh, we are saying if we have uh, so many universities now, can we as a country, and there's nothing new about what we're trying to do here, it's been done elsewhere, can we come up with a national portal, right? A national portal. That does one important thing. It collects all the dissertations and the theses produced from universities around Zambia and then presents them in one location. All right? Why? We're not just doing we're not just doing this masters because I guess for most of us it's because of the qualification. I know I did part because of the qualification, right? I think the advantages of the qualification, but but it turns out that the research that we do might be useful to Zambia as a whole, right? Um, right now, I mean, there are NGOs that are working towards, you know, trying to uplift, uh, uplift people from poverty. There are people doing interesting research in education. But because we don't have um, an effective way of showcasing that work, people have no clue. People outside the UNSA have no clue what it is we are doing. And in fact, people will tell you, but what do you do at UNSA? What sort of research do you do? It, it turns out we do a lot of serious research, right? And it's, most of it actually comes from uh, postgraduate students, as is the case for most, most universities. The chunk of research is done by postgraduate students, right? So our argument is we can do this. Not only do we want to make sure that people have access to this information, but we want to try and ensure that there, there isn't really duplication of effort there's a chance that someone from, I know Mongushi has, I think there's a LIS program there, I could be wrong, maybe not. There's a chance that someone is working in a similar area, right? Or there's a chance that someone from maybe CBU might want to explore indigenous knowledge. Now, if they don't, if you're not exposing that in an institution repository, or if it's difficult for people to find that information, they might end up doing something similar, if not exactly as you did, right? So. Uh, but really, it's more about making sure that uh, output from postgraduate students is, is easily visible, right? So same concept as uh, this thing we are calling NDOTD portal and whatnot, and, but we are also taking advantage of the OIPMH protocol, made data harvesting, right? So you get to pull information using different schemes here. Um, 
you can specify Dublin. Usually, for the most part, putting information using Dublin core works just fine. Right? Which is why, by the way, at some stage I'll show you the metadata prefix here. Whenever you have a metadata prefix that says OAI under bar DC, it means you're putting information using Dublin core. But you can also pull information using other schemes, right? Like, I wouldn't be surprised if the union catalog pulls information using ETDMS. But if we were to go to, because the Unza repository is a bit uh, thing, if we were to go to, the, let me just showcase what I mean by the different, we don't want to lose track of what we're talking about here, the different metadata schemes I was talking about. So this is the still UCT repository. Observe, if I say list, uh, list, uh, is it metadata formats? This thing will list all the different ways I can put information. So I can put information using UK ETDDC, QDC, right? Um, DIDL, some of these things I don't know. Modes, uh, ORE, object resource. Is it object resource? I don't know what, I've forgotten what the E stands for. Um, but if you want to pull the bit streams, the actual PDFs, METs. Dublin Core, right, OI Dublin Core, uh, RDF, which we know, right, resource description format or something, MAC, right, MAC we are familiar with, all these different things, but where is ETDMS, right? Now, the thing is, if you, once you use this, this particular verb here, the list metadata formats verb, and you, you start viewing records using the different formats, observe, if I say I want to view things using ETDMS, the way that I view the metadata is going to be different somehow. And I think what would be, what would have been nice here is if you reviewed this from, uh, uh, if we could pull, you know, maybe we can do that. I'll, I'll open ETDMS, and then I'll open the same documents using RDF. I'll open the same records using METS so that we see the diff different ways in which information is being presented, and then I also use modes, I guess, and then um, I'm looking for OAI DC, which is the normal way of doing things. Now observe the way we see things when you say metadata here. This is uh, ETDMS, right? These are the tags we're using. I, hope, I don't know if they've implemented this. This is using RDF. I don't know if you can see the differences. Probably not. Uh, this is using METS. This is more prominent, actually, right? You can see that the, if you compare the output of of um, this particular, it's probably the same record, actually. I wouldn't be surprised if it was. I think it is. Uh, Vinic AL is the name. I hope this is, the, or is it Alan MV? If we compare it with, with um, You notice the difference, right? I don't know if you can see the difference here. The difference is there because you might, for instance, if you say, did we have a Mark, right? Also, I don't know if we have Mark. If you wanted to pull some of this information and then integrate them with Koha, and you know that your Koha instance uses Mark, then it makes sense that you pull this information using the Mark metadata scheme. I don't know if this makes sense. If you are putting this information and then exposing it, or you're putting it from a platform that only handles electronic thesis and dissertation, you might as well put this information using ETDMS metadata scheme. In fact, what you're doing behind the scenes, you're just you're going through a process of cross-walking. So you're converting the descriptive information into a format that would be easily recognizable by the platform you want to reuse that information within. Right? So Essentially, this is what the metadata, um, the list metadata format uh, or format um, verb actually does. It lists, it tells you which metadata schemes you can use to extract information. And at this stage, you, you would not have already extracted the information. But when you get to the stage where, well, not here, but you get to the stage where you actually want to extract the information, then you specify to say, I want to pull the records using 
this metadata scheme, like in this case, by default, I, I always specify YIDC, the Dublin core, just because it's generic and I, I can, or you can reuse it easily elsewhere. But not only that, the other verb that is there is a list set verb. Like, you remember we said, um, typically, you would, uh, when you have um, a digital library platform like this space or ePrints, one of the things you do is you, you, you store the information in some sort of hierarchical structure by specifying collections and communities in the case of this space. What list, what the list sets verb does, which is nothing more than list sets one word, is it prints out or it outputs a list of all the communities and collections that you have in that repository, in that digital library platform. So in our case, everything that we see on the homepage when you go to the UNSA homepage, um, hopefully it's working now, but if we go to the UNSA homepage and we say um, we wish to um, go here, please work. Very intermittent. Uh, doesn't matter, we use the UCT repository. If we go to the UCT repository on the homepage, <clears throat> community, these are communities, right? So hierarchy, top level hierarchy has communities. Within the communities, you might have sub-communities or collections and sub-collections. So, oh, you wanted to get the UCT. Uh, it's nice, they spent a lot of money. I, I know about how much they hired a company called Admire for them to do this, which is why it looks uh, more beautiful than the UNSA repository. <laughs> no, I mean, it does, right? There's, it's down to the T here, the font consistency and the structure, you know. Um, they, they had, uh, they, they had money for this project, actually. It was an I, I, IDRC funded project uh, under SCARP, which I was, uh, remember I was a part of it, but but so communities and then um, within a community you might have uh, sub-communities and collections. So all of these things, these structures we have here, right? Like uh, masters in this case is a collection and then you store things in the collection. These things are the sets we're referring to. So when you issue the list set verb, what you're doing is you're outputting a list of those communities and collections. You can see this, this map onto the things you see on the OZA homepage. Um, and by, by convention, what this space does is all, all communities have an identifier, unique identifier that starts with com underbar for community, right? C-O-M underbar with the identity of the community, right? Anything with a, there's no C-O-L, but if we had a C-O-L, that would be a collection. That's a standard way of naming sets in this space, but maybe to appreciate what we're talking about here, we can access what we have access to, so the UCT um, repository, we'll go there and then we will issue the list sets verb. I don't know if you can see. So what I did was I just issued the list set verb, right? What you are seeing here, um, Disability, Inclusion, Education, MOOCs. These are all communities, incidentally. Yeah? I don't know if you can see a coloration between what we are seeing here. If we go to the homepage here, can, can, can we notice that we can see thesis and dissertation research output, open education resources, other publications on this list, right? Research output, thesis and dissertation, you know? All of them are listed here with their corresponding identifier. So the way that you identify research output, it has a unique identifier called com underbar 11427 underbar 29114. Now you soon see why this is important because there are times when you might want to extract information using the OIPMH protocol selectively, right? So you specify to say, by default you pull everything, but you are just interested in pulling information in here. So you, spec you specify that you want to put information from here by specifying the ID of the set, right? Um, so, uh, we'll look at an example just now, but maybe we can do it just now. Observe, if I said I wanted to pull, I just wanted, someone says, 
pull all the ETDs from the UCT repository. You get the identifier, you'll soon see how to do this, and then you say list, um, I get, oh, it's already here, list record, okay. <clears throat> so when I pull everything, when I pull the, uh, when I pull, when I pull the records from UCT right now, you notice that I have how many? 27,000 objects, right? I don't know if you can see that. But when I tell this repository to say, wait a minute, I don't want to pull everything, but I'm just interested in, I'm just interested in um, ETDs. The number will shrink slightly. Although the huge chunk of content, as with most places, is going to be ETDs. So instead of 27,000, I, no I now know that there are a total of 19,448 master's dissertations and PhD theses in the UCT repository. Um, if I wanted to pull uh, MOOC resources or whatever else I wanted to pull from here, I would do exactly that. Don't know if this is making sense, but. Yeah, so this is what the list, this is one of the ways in which we can take advantage of the list set verb. Um, I know uh, Angela is doing, because her, analysis, her focus is on ETDs, she's making extensive use of this. Um, which is, I guess, if, uh, let's, let's pause and think about this for a minute, right? Remember I, I took us, and I, I know we're talking about a number of things, but I discussed the union catalog not so long ago, right? Where I said we, uh, it, it houses information from different universities, this thing here. We said around the world right now, this has, a, has collected a total of 5.8 million ETDs. Now the thing here is, the, this um, Warden University, the, the, the repository at Warden University doesn't, is not just used to archive ETDs. There are other things there, just like the UCT repository, right? If we check for University of Cape, let's use University of Cape Town, I think it would be, oh, it's not here, a shame. Why? I wanted to use it as an example. But the thing is, because the union catalog platform is only interested in getting electronic theses and dissertations from around the world, what they do behind the scenes is for each of these repositories, they specify the set or the sets associated with ETDs. Otherwise, they'll be putting everything, right? In, including, like, if you look at the UCT if you look at the UCT portal, if they were not specifying the sets, so they'd be putting research output, open education resources, and other publications. So the way that they would selectively specify to say, for each of the repositories where we're putting information from, we only want ETDs, you specify the set ID associated with that particular community or collection where ETDs are sitting. So if effectively what you're doing behind the scenes is when you tell them to say, we want you to start putting content from our repository, Probably one of the things I'll ask for is give us the ID or the IDs associated with the collections where you, or the communities where you put ETDs into. And then they'll use those things to pull information from here. Right, so I don't know if that makes some sense. Is this making some sense? Would, would, uh, maybe we can pause for now and then we let, or we can continue and finish off the verbs. We can continue. <laughs> That's the verbs. I guess we can continue. Okay, let's continue. And then we'll, I, I don't know what people, we can continue and finish off the verbs because we've done three, we're remaining with three more. And then we can look at case studies maybe on wisdom. Is that? Okay, so. Now that we know how to selectively pull information, um, there are times when you might just be interested in pulling unique IDs, just the identifiers, the global identifiers, um, associated with um, the repository. You use the least identifiers verb. But you'll notice something different with the least identifiers verb. You need to specify the metadata format that you're pulling those identifiers with, right? So in this case, I'm using YDC, right? So Again, as an example, if we were to go here and say we want to use the least identifier verb, uh, beauty with the latest version of this space is you can just click, you don't have to memorize the verbs here. So identifiers, 
what you're pulling is going to be I just put a get record, not the list identifier there. I apologize. Okay, so what, what this has done now is, you notice that all we have is just the IDs, right? So this is the, this is the, the get request we just made. I'll just uh, put, look at this. This is, the, this is how we're accessing the list identifiers verb, right? Which is this. Um, but I, I want, one of the things I mentioned is that you don't issue this request in isolation. It needs to explicitly state what format you're pulling the identifiers with, right? So the metadata uh, uh, format that you're using, in this case, it's OAIDC. But the result you get, I was saying, is just the identifiers, right? Yeah? Identifiers. Yeah? Identifiers. So the individual unique identifiers for all the digital objects. What you have here, when you click this, what you're doing is you're accessing content using a separate verb. So when I click that link, I'm accessing the details associated with that identifier using the get record verb, right, which we discussed just now. So the list identifier only lists the unique identifiers associated with the digital objects. Um, and then, I mean, list records, um, it's similar to list identifiers, but in this case, you're not just outputting the identifier, but also the descriptive metadata associated with the object. So you're listing all the records with their corresponding descriptive information. Observe, if I go back to, um, if I go back here and just get to records, list records, <clears throat> you notice that the output that I have now um, has slightly more information. So each record has corresponding metadata with it and the sets where it's sitting, right? So these sets, these are the set specs they collect. So this tells you which community this object is in, which collection, and the corresponding descriptive information, DC title, DC creator, DC contributor, DC subject, DC description, DC date, DC date, DC date, DC type, DC type, DC type, uh, DC identifier, DC identifier, two identifiers here. They're repeated, DC, DC publisher, DC publisher, DC publisher, right? The, if you remember the workflow, the submission workflow we're going through, this is the information that someone was keying in as they were ingesting this content. Um, and then, so just identifiers associated with the digital objects, detailed information associated with the different records, right, or the dis, uh, different digital objects. Um, and then finally, you have the get record verb, which selectively specifies which object you want to pick. So with the get record verb, you are only retaining one result. <clears throat> and because you are retaining one result, you must specify the unique local identifier for that object. Yeah? If you, if you observe the get request we're issuing here, or the, the way we're accessing the, we are using the verb, we say the verb is get record. We specify the format that we want to use to, to get that particular record. Do we want to output the metadata using ETDMS, using Dublin call, using mods, using mets, using mark, or using RDF, right, which is a format? Or, uh, 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 yeah, or using mark. And then, additionally, you specify that because the get record only returns one record, you must specify the unique identifier of the record that you want to get. The record you're interested in is get record, right? So identifier. And then it outputs us what that one record. So that's essentially that's how the six verbs work, right? Pretty easy. Um, I guess because there's just six of them. The most useful ones are the list records. Well, the most commonly used ones, list records, list identifier, and get record. Why? Because these others are just, like the first one we looked at, the identifier, just tells you, gives you de details of the repository, email address, contact email address. <laughs> I, I wonder if the dispatch at unza.zm actually works. <laughs> I, I rhetorically just, it's like, I'm, you know how you, uh, what do they call people that, uh, 
speak ill of themselves. Right? You, you see, yeah, you see. <laughs> We're trying to point out the negative things about how we do things. This is how we change. Uh, it's important to talk about these things. And also, the, the beauty about talking about the, the negative things about how we do things is it gives us an opportunity to figure out what sort of problems we can try and do if you're interested in this particular area, right? Because that's the whole essence of what, I mean, the research we're doing, solving a problem. Uh, so I said this, the list metadata format, not so useful because you only use it to check what formats you can use to output information, that's all. If you already know upfront, say you're just interested in Dublin Core, no need to actually use this, you won't use this. Right? List sets, you use this to identify the unique code associated with the set where you want to extract information from. Right? So if you're interested in just content from the School of Education preprints, you need to know which ID is associated with the School of Education community, which is COM underbar 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and about one, right, um, or engineering. So, uh, uh, by the way, just to mention here, you know how it's common for university websites to have separate pages um, or domains for different schools? And one of the things you might want to do on that particular school page is you list publications in your school. Instead of having people to for each member of staff, you start calling them, please update your publications. What you can do is you can tell them to just upload the content in one platform, which is a repository, and then you selectively pull that information from the repository using a protocol like OIPMH. So if you're, you want to publish, you want to output publications from the School of Engineering, all you have to do is go to the repository, assuming everybody has been ingesting content into there, and then you specify to say, um, list records uh, and set is equal to command about to seven eight nine and about fourteen and then it will output everything from this particular community. If you want to selectively put things from the Department of Electrical Engineering, assuming content is being slotted into department, you selectively pull that information. You can also selectively pull information from individual authors. You know so and then list identifier, which is just uh, outputting the IDs, unique IDs of the content, and then list records, um, details, and then get record. Maybe we can continue uh, the last few minutes. Maybe we can talk about, I don't know. We'll finish off this discussion of this maybe Wednesday. Or maybe we can finish, right? Sorry? <laughs> yeah, so we can continue on Wednesday. Uh, the thing with life is, uh, if if I if we asked uh, you to tell us what you do on a daily basis, you do exactly what I'm doing, and you don't feel tired because you've been doing this for years, right? So it's <laughs> so. But I don't know if there are any questions so far. We shall continue this. We shall integrate this with our practical session. I'm trying to see if we can uh, do two things on Wednesday. Actually, we maybe. Not maybe we we we'll move to the lab, the Odell Laboratory at fourteen because it's booked between thirteen and fourteen, which is unfortunate. So maybe we'll spend the first hour trying to prepare for the lab exercise that we will do. Uh, and I think what would be interesting is maybe if we work in groups of twos or threes or something during the exercise. Uh, so the first hour we'll still spend in three three B and then we'll move to the Odell lab to go and do the lab or something. Um, I don't know. But by the way, so these things are in the uh, thing, right? So in, in the database, and so they're being pulled. Uh, remember, this DC title, this is sitting in a relational database management system somewhere behind. But the PDF are on the um, file system, just to mention that. It's always important to link the different things we've talked about. And uh, okay, so then Wednesday. Uh, yes, just in case the the thing with the lab sometimes is um, there's usually issues, but I'm sure it will be working just. But just in case we can come with laptops. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me, let me. And again, just as we are packing, just to emphasize that the, 
repositories is not just, I mean, the, this thing, this space is not just for repositories, right? Um, if you're working for in a corporate organization, you can use something like this as a document management platform, yeah? If you're storing documents, you need to describe those documents, like an entity like ZRA, for instance, or BOS, who generate thousands or hundreds of documents in any given year, where they're being kept, right? Those are records, obviously, maybe you could use a records management platform, perhaps, perhaps you can use a document management platform, like this place does work as a doc document management platform, but it does not function out of the box as a records management platform, because you, there's nothing to do with, uh, what are those, the records management li life cycle we talk about, right? Like, uh, what do you do to a document after it's, you know, destruction and whatnot, and yeah, so, so I'm just saying, you can use this as a document management platform. It's not just uh, used as an institutional repository, which is why I was pointing to indigenous knowledge and, you know, so I thought I would mention that. <laughs>